a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Jesus is always able to save those who approach God through him, since he lives forever to make intercession for them. It was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, higher than the heavens. He has no need, as did the high priests, to offer sacrifice day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. He did that once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints men subject to weakness to be high priests, but the word of the oath, which was taken after the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The main point of what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. Now every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus the necessity for this one also to have something to offer. If then he were on heaven, he would not be a priest, since there are those who offer gifts according to the law. They worship in a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, as Moses was warned when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For God says, See that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now he has obtained so much more excellent a ministry as he is mediator of a better covenant, enacted on better promises. The word of the Lord. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Sacrifice or oblation you wish not but ears open to obedience you gave me. Burnt offerings or sin offerings you sought not. Then said I, Behold, I come. In the wit- written scroll it is prescribed for me to do your will, O oh my God, is my delight, and your law is within my heart. I announced your justice in the vast assembly. I did not restrain my lips, as you, O Lord, know. May all who seek you exalt and be glad in you. And may those who love your salvation say ever, the Lord be glorified. Dominus vobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Marcum. Jesus withdrew toward the sea with his disciples. A large number of people followed from Galilee and from Judea. Hearing what he was doing, a large number of people came to him also from Jerusalem, from Idumea, from beyond the Jordan, and from the neighborhood of Tyre and Sidon. He told his disciples 
to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crush him. He had cured many, and as a result, those who had diseases were pressing upon him to touch him. And whenever unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. He warned them sternly not to make him known. Verbum Domini. We welcome today Father Jess T, who's here with some friends from Our Lady of Joy in Carefree, Arizona. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful place? Our Lady of Joy in Carefree, Arizona. So I welcome you today, Father, and uh, plans to visit the shrine today as well. In today's homily, I'd like to talk about two things. The first, reg regarding the gospel, how it seems the whole world was wanting to come to Jesus, to touch him, to be with Jesus. And then the second point, I wanted to talk about our saint that we celebrate today, St. Francis de Sales, who's called the Gentleman Saint, and talk about the fruit of the spirit of gentleness. Yesterday, if you had a chance to see Jim and Joy's program, Kevin Dunn was on that program talking about some films that he has made. He's been involved, his father was involved in television, he's been involved in the media his whole life, and he helps us with our March for Life coverage in Canada. And he's also a filmmaker who's made some films. You may have seen uh, one of his works on euthanasia. And there's another more recent one called Fatal Flaws. And it changes, so it's fatal laws. So he's talking about laws, the legalization of euthanasia in countries like the Netherlands and Belgium and now in certain countries in the United States, in California, Oregon, and other places. And so he traveled all over these places to see, well, what are the fruits in the culture that we see when these laws are passed? What is the effect on people, on doctors, on medicine generally? And it's quite an eye-opening documentary, Fatal Flaws. So he gave me a copy, which I had opportunity to watch last night. And what he came to see is that what develops in these places where you have the legalization of euthanasia, that you see that a certain level of people are considered that their lives are not worth living. And in fact, there's a subtle coercion for them to get out of the way, stop being a burden, stop being selfish, stop being in the way. And he interviews people with real life examples. In Canada also, they've legalized euthanasia. So he visits this mother and her daughter who was born with cerebral palsy in uh, near Nova Scotia. And this girl's name is Candace. And Candace was very sick, she was very ill. And so the doctor was talking to the mother and saying, well, you know, in Canada, euthanasia is legalized. She's, your daughter is very sick. She said, well, I didn't know it was legalized, but I'm not interested in that. Later, she found him talking to the daughter, you're very sick. She, and the mother, seeing that, said, get out of here. Don't ever come in here again. But there's a subtle coercion. So she brought her daughter back home, and the community there helped with the care of her daughter so that now she's doing much better. But you could see this, this beautiful love between the mother and the daughter, even though with the passage of this law, there's kind of seen that, well, now her life really is in the way. 
it's causing too much trouble, too much burden. But the question is, what are we called to? Are we called to just have an efficient culture where everyone produces the maximum amount? Or are we called to love? Is that really what the meaning of life is? Yes, to learn to love, which is the life of heaven, the life of loving God and of loving others. And so he talked also, Kevin talked about a new project that he has underway, a new film project uh, called I Samaritan, where he shows these, he's going to be showing these real life examples of people who are good Samaritans. They see that weak person along the roadside and they pick them up and they assist them and so on. And of course, that's what we're called to do. And we see that exemplified in uh, the gospel today, that you had people from everywhere, they they're hearing about Jesus. So they come from as far as way as Idumea, which is 100 miles to the south of where Jesus was, the Sea of Galilee. They come from across the Jordan River, which is modern day Jordan and Syria. They come from Tyre and Sidon, which is modern day Lebanon. They're coming from the west and the east and the north and the south, a hundred miles away. And some of them are Gentiles. Some of these are Gentile nations. And Jesus sees there's going to be, there's this huge crowd coming. And we see here both his humanity and his divinity. His humanity says, have a boat ready because I could get crushed. So he could pull out in that boat a little farther away if it was necessary but also his divinity and that the people were healed when they came into contact with him. They were pressing against him, Mark says, just so that they might touch him. And, and many were healed, many were healed. So we see his compassion for them too. He doesn't run away from the crowd that's coming to him. These people with all their burdens, their weaknesses and their struggles and all this that they're bringing because they're finding hope in, in Jesus Christ. So he doesn't flee from them or hide from them, but he says, just have a boat ready in case, you know, I'm in danger of being crushed. But they're pressing against him, they're touching him. He's with them. And that's what we're, well, that's what we're called to do as well. As Kevin Dunn brings out, you know, today's saint, St. Francis de Sales, is a patron of journalists and the Catholic press. And that's what we're trying to do with the media enterprise here and the various outreaches of that, to bring that truth of the beauty of love, to bring that to the world, to help us to see that and to delight in it, right? That we love to love, we love to be love, because that's really the goal of our existence is to grow in the love of God and the love of others. And it's often when we encounter those who are in a particular need or even in your own home and meeting their needs that our own lives are, are, are enriched by being like Jesus, allowing them to press upon us, allowing them to you know, affect us, but being there in whatever way we can to be a healing remedy to them, at least listening, at least um, suffering with them in their struggles and challenges, not getting them out of the way as euthanasia does and as these laws get passed, Kevin brings out so very clearly, then there's a subtle coercion. Oh, I really should stop being here and get out of the way. No, we have the means to be able to help people, well, let us do it. Then the other point that I wanted to bring out today was our saint that we celebrate today, St. Francis de Sale, called the Gentleman Saint. And our prayers today actually mention three times, it speaks of his gentleness or meekness. Those are two words that are used um, for really the same idea, gentleness and meekness. So what did our collect at the beginning of Mass say? Grant that following his example, Francis de Sales, we may always display the gentleness 
of your charity and the service of our neighbor. Our offertory prayer, kindle in our hearts that divine fire of the Holy Spirit with which you wonderfully inflamed the most gentle soul of St. Francis de Sales because gentleness is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And then finally, our prayer after communi communion, may we imitate on earth the charity and meekness of St. Francis de Sales. So obviously, the church is bringing out to us today this characteristic of St. Francis de Sales. In fact, you know, St. John Bosco, he had followers who did work with him. They're not called the Boscans. They're called the Salesians. And why is that after St. Francis de Sales? It's because when St. John Bosco was ordained, he had nine resolutions. And one of the resolutions was that the charity and sweetness of St. Francis de Sales is going to influence everything I do. And that's what he wanted for his followers. And so that's why they're called the Salesians. St. Vincent de Paul as well, he wanted all of those who were members of his community to read St. Francis de Sales' treatise on the love of God. So he's called the gentleman saint, but his biographies tell us that naturally he had a hot temper. That should give us some hope, right? That here's a man who had this hot temper and yet he was able to master this rough disposition. So he became known, as our prayers today point out, his charity, meekness, and gentleness. How did he do it? By patiently striving day after day he mastered his disposition to such an extent that he became known as the gentle, kind, and meek saint. There was one occasion in his life when this man had come in. He was a bishop at the time. He's one of the doctors of the church, St. Francis de Sales. And this man was very angry at Francis de Sales or what was going on, and so he refused to remove his hat, which was a sign of disrespect at the time. And he came in and he's hurling all these insults. And all the people around are looking and they're just you know, taken aback by what this man did. And then the man stormed off. And here's what Francis de Sales said. He said, I should be grateful, grateful to him for having relieved me of the need to respond to his arguments. <laughs> so he just came in, hurled the insults and left. I didn't have to respond, so. But he mastered that through the grace of God. And he talks about the life of devotion. It was that life of devotion. It was that fruit of the Holy Spirit that enabled him to be transformed, to be transformed. On one occasion, too, he was criticized for how kind he was to sinners. And here's what he said. If there were anything more excellent than meekness, God would certainly have taught it to us. And yet there is nothing to which he so earnestly exhorts us as to be meek and humble of heart. Why would you hinder me from obeying the command of my Lord and following him in the exercise of that virtue which he so eminently practiced and so highly esteems. Can we really be better advised in these, advised in these matters than God himself? So of course he's quoting Jesus' own words, learn from me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble of heart. So he's saying is, that's what he taught us. And at the time, there were many who were leaving the church, but then he was an instrument. He would create these leaflets, which explained the Catholic faith, which were handed out, and he would preach about the Catholic faith, and many returned. And some said, you shouldn't be welcome these, welcoming these apostates. Well, he said, well, if Saul had been cast off, we, we would have never had St. Paul. 
So you think about Barnabas, that son of encouragement who welcomed Paul and introduced him to the apostles and the gentleness that Paul experienced in that welcome, that he became this great apostle. So what is this fruit of gentleness? The person who possesses Christian meekness, gentleness, is affectionate and tender toward everyone. He is disposed, disposed to forgive and excuse the frailties of others. The goodness of his heart appears in a sweet affability that influences his words and actions and presents every object to his view in the most charitable and pleasing light. So we can often look at people with suspicion or try to see the worst in them, amplify their faults, or with this sort of disposition of meekness and gentleness to try to interpret everything in the most charitable way regarding their lives. Again, this person never allows himself or herself to use a harsh phrase, much less any language that is haughty or rude. There's always a gentle serenity in his expression. And it really expresses trust in God's providence. We can be control freaks and we get frustrated when we can't control other people. Or we can trust and pray to God for their particular needs that, that we might recognize that he would influence them, that he would give them the graces that they need that we see and we recognize in them. And so it's not about any sort of pressure or coercion, but it's about letting God do his work in his soul and being an intercessor for them. And if we speak to people with respect, always, there's never an occasion when we should ever speak disrespectfully to anyone. But if we speak to them with respect, then it means that we're recognizing their dignity before God. We're recognizing that they're a child of God and that we respect that. And then they can hear it, what we may have to say. If we begin with just harsh words and disrespect, who's going to listen to that? There's a beautiful book, The Hidden Power of Kindness, which kind of tells the same sort of theme. So my dear brothers and sisters, let us continue to be those um, good Samaritans in the world, the troubled people that we encounter in our daily lives, like our Lord who was there, allowing them to press upon him to come to him, to burden him. And let us learn from St. Francis de Sales to have that gentleness, that gentleness that itself evangelizes, that touches people, it's strength but under control, strength guided by the Spirit of God that brings forth the fruit of gentleness.